Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first uh, medical education program put together by Tactile Medical. I'm Tony Gasparis. I'm the chair for the Scientific Advisory Board for Tactile. And with me tonight is Julie Green and, and Susan Ellenson, who are uh, uh, therapists uh, with expertise in the lymphedema space. Um, <clears throat> when uh, we were discussing with the uh, team at Tactile what to really put together on this year's program for topics, I thought it would be great to start off the year with uh, how do we evaluate patients with leg swelling? And more importantly, especially for, for the physicians in the audience, I thought it would be, being a physician myself, um, to really get a better understanding of how you manage these patients in a non-surgical fashion, um, especially with uh, MLD and, and CDT. Um, we, we send and we refer, refer patients out to uh, lymphedema therapists all the time, but I don't think many of the physicians understand the details of what's involved in that therapy. Um, so we're going to kick off with uh, me talking about um, the evaluation of the patients, uh, what do we look for, and with us today, actually, uh, I have one of my patients uh, who will be participating, and I'll be interviewing her as far as what type of questions I ask patients who present with leg swelling. Um, I'd like to remind everybody, for any questions, please submit them in the uh, Q&A box at the bottom, and also remind you that if you're uh, not able to listen to the whole webinar, if you want to go back and listen to it another time, this will be, uh, this is being recorded and will be available uh, for future uh, playback. Um, so I will get started and kick off uh, with the uh, evaluation of patients with uh, leg swelling. So here we go, hold on one second. So usually patients with leg swelling, uh, there's different signs and symptoms that they may have uh, with or without, with the, with the swelling. And these may include, you know, they may complain of some pain or itchiness, uh, cramps, less, restless leg, heaviness in the leg, they may have leg pain and claudication. Um, and then from a, from a physical exam perspective, other than the swelling, they may have discoloration in the skin uh, and or ulceration. Uh, so this is the typical things you wanna obviously ask for when, when you're interviewing a patient as far as signs and symptoms uh, in addition to the swelling. And the differential diagnosis for a swollen leg is pretty extensive. Uh, you can have anything from systemic causes, uh, infections and inflammation, uh, obviously metabolic causes. Obesity, I think, is one of the main reasons for leg swelling, given the uh, obesity epidemic in the US. Uh, a lot of the patients present with clinical signs of um, lymphedema where uh, the obesity is contributing to that. Um, medications is a very common cause, especially new onset of medications uh, for development of leg swelling. When me as a vascular specialist, obviously, I'm looking at things like venous disease, uh, as an as a underlying cause of, uh, of leg swelling. So really, in my mind, the first question you want to ask a patient is, is the symptoms or the swelling unilateral or bilateral? That can pretty much exclude uh, a lot of things from the uh, differential diagnosis. So if somebody presents with swelling in one leg, you kind of almost immediately exclude systemic causes um, from the list. So, you know, lung problems, uh, uh, renal problems, cardiac and pulmonary problems, um, and obviously obesity as well too. Usually with obesity, you'll see bilateral leg swelling. Um, so not, not only if it's unilateral or bilateral, but also the location and extent of swelling. Is it in the leg? Is it in the thigh? Uh, is it involved both? Um, does it include or involve the foot and toes? The duration of the swelling, so is it recent or longstanding? Um, we call it acute or chronic. And, you know, when you have somebody that presents with new onset of leg swelling, you think of more acute situations like an inflammatory process, an infection, um, a DVT, uh, versus one that's, or, or even a malignancy that's a new, new malignancy in the pelvis potentially causing uh, lymphatic obstruction or venous obstruction. Um, and then longstanding uh, symptoms, obviously, we'll talk about. Uh, and here you can see uh, a list of some of the differential diagnosis looking at patients with unilateral swelling, whether they're acute symptoms or chronic symptoms, and then bilateral uh, uh, patients with bilateral symptoms, 
uh, again, depending the differential, if it's acute or chronic. So somebody, for example, with bilateral acute symptoms, think about maybe bilateral DVT, acute heart failure or renal failure versus more chronic things such as venous disease, uh, chronic pulmonary hypertension or heart failure, lymphedema, um, drugs, uh, pregnancy or obesity. So other questions to ask is, you know, what makes it worse? What makes it better? How do, does your symptoms improve with uh, elevation or do they completely resolve or you always have residual swelling at the end of the day. And that helps you also uh, figure out what from that differential on the list uh, you start thinking as the cause of the swelling. Other clinical symptoms related uh, to limb uh, or systemic include, you know, pain, heaviness, bruising, like I mentioned earlier, you know, think of uh, uh, weight loss, uh, acute onset of weight loss, fevers or night sweats, if you're thinking of potentially a malignancy going on. And obviously in the COVID uh, era that we live in, I've seen a good number of patients present with, uh, with leg swelling uh, after COVID. Uh, past medical history and obviously surgical history is very important as well as family history. We know that uh, venous disease could be very, it can be hereditary. So um, that's one of the things you wanna see and ask for as well as any surgeries or trauma or infection or history of ulcers or history of DVT. Patients with deep vein thrombosis may have uh, chronic post-thrombotic syndrome and have residual uh, long-term swelling and skin damage from that. And the, the chronic venous hypertension can lead uh, to lymphatic dysfunction as well. Obviously, like I said, medications are, and this is a list of the common medications that may lead uh, to leg swelling. And this is kind of a, um, an algorithm that we put together in evaluating a patient with chronic edema, which we defined as more than three months. You wanna evaluate the patient for any systemic causes that we've talked about, if they are, uh, then make sure that the patient gets treated appropriately for those systemic causes. And usually if they're, let's say, are in heart failure and you diurese the patient, they should uh, improve. If not, or if their symptoms do not resolve completely, start thinking of more vascular causes. Um, and here uh, we're talking, uh, we proceed with an ultrasound to evaluate uh, not only the veins below the inguinal ligament in the legs, but also in the pelvis. And if it's... Uh, um, uh, you know, looking for either venous problems, lymphatic problems. And this lipedema, you can see it on ultrasound, but also from the clinical picture and the history of the patient. Um, both in venous disease and lipedema, you can have a combination of uh, flebo lymphedema or lipo lymphedema. Uh, uh, and these patients obviously um, uh, are not very easy to manage because of the longstanding underlying chronic disease, primary disease leading to further lymphatic dysfunction. So key messages, um, the differential diagnosis for chronic leg swelling is pretty extensive. The underlying cause may uh, not be mutually uh, exclusive. Uh, with patients with systemic causes uh, are eliminated, evaluated, evaluate the patient for any venous or lymphatic pathology. Um, and at this point, I'd like to stop sharing my screen and um, I'd like to ask uh, our patient to, to join us, Fiona. Hi. Hi, Fiona. Thanks for, for, for participating. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, um, why did you come see me? Uh, well, yeah, so I've been having uh, swelling on my left leg uh, for about three years now. And uh, a lot of doctors didn't know what was going on. So they kind of jumped me around to different um, doctors. And I was finally referred to you um, to kind of, you know, get a better picture of what was going on. Okay. So this is a typical patient uh, that we've talked about with chronic uh, swelling, right? So it's over three years. Um, and it's one sided, so unilateral. So you automatically we know that she doesn't have, and she's young. Um, how old are you, Fiona? Uh, 25. All right. So you don't really think of, you know, normally in a 25 year old of systemic causes, uh, even, if, even, if, even if she had bilateral uh, swelling, you know, no heart failure, no kidney problems that you have a history of? No. All right. And um, you've had it for three years. Has it changed at all over the last three years? Um, yeah, definitely. When I first got it, it was just swelling. And over the years, it got bigger and more pain. Where, what part of your leg is swollen? And has uh, it changed over time? Uh, it's basically from my toes all the way to my thigh. 
Um, uh, but at first, I noticed it more in my ankles and my foot, and then eventually, like the thigh and the toes got more swollen. Okay. Um, so more of a progressive over time. Mm -hmm. And anything that you notice makes it better or improves it? Uh, well, the pump definitely helps. Uh, compression stockings definitely help. If I don't wear compression stockings, my foot turns really red and it hurts. If you, if you're laying, when you wake up in the morning, how's your leg comparing to the end of the day? It's definitely uh, smaller and not as swollen as end of the day. So there is improvement with, mm -hmm. with elevation. Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, Julie, Susan, any comments on, so far? Um, I just have a question about, um, do you currently wear any night garments or any compression overnight or not? Uh, no, I just wear it during the day when I'm like sitting, standing, moving around. And then my, my curiosity is uh, when you first were um, feeling some of the symptoms, did your primary care physician offer you any stockings or did they really talk to you about managing the swelling? I know that you said they, they didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. So they didn't, um, you know, they didn't know what was going on. So they didn't really know about compression stockings. Um, and it wasn't until I, like I got to uh, like vascular surgeons and that's when people, that's when the doctors recommended me compression stockings. Okay. So yeah. what point did you receive like a, a diagnosis of lymphedema as well? Was it not until you reached Dr. Kasparis or had you even heard the term prior to that? Um, so I, I did have a few, I did see a few other vascular surgeons before Dr. Kasparis and they did uh, diagnose me with lymphedema. And I would say probably almost like at least half a year since I first started having the, the swelling happen is when I actually got an official diagnosis. Gotcha. Thank you. Any, any surgeries you've had? No, no surgeries. Any medications you take? Nope. Okay. And again, these are medications usually you would expect bilateral swelling, not unilateral. Um, so Fiona, just I'm explaining a little bit my line of thinking when, when we're asking you the questions uh, as far as what I suspect. And I know Susan kind of already said that you've been diagnosed with lymphedema, um, but did you have any uh, vascular studies or ultrasounds before uh seeing yeah, I, I do get vascular, I mean, uh, ultrasounds, um, you know, at your office, I did one and uh, another vascular surgeon, they did some, um, and I also did an MRI, you know. Okay. Um, no weight loss, fevers, chills, anything? Oh. Okay. And tell me a little bit about the pain in your leg. Um, the pain kind of varies. It's like a heavy achiness. Um, so I noticed there's definitely an improvement when you wear the compression stocking. I don't feel the pain, but if I don't also, uh, if I were to walk around without any stockings for like maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'll definitely feel like the achiness and the heaviness building up. Okay. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again and just show everybody, uh, the clinical picture here. So this is her right leg. And this is her left leg, obviously. And you can see, um, Julie, you wanna, or Susan, you wanna comment as far as, you can see there's loss of definition of the ankle, uh, loss of definition of the kneecap, uh, and the edema or the swelling involves the toes all the way up into the thigh. Uh, anything else? I mean, there's no skin changes or anything that you notice, Fiona? Uh, no, so far no. I'll, only if I don't wear the compression stocking, if I walk around, then yeah, it'll turn all red. Other than that, uh, it's like normal. All right. Any comments on the on the clinical picture? I would just say in the foot there, you know, starting to see some of the increased creases along the, the toes there and the joint lines, those types of things as well. Okay. So would you say this is a very classic uh, picture of, of uh, primary lymphedema? Uh, definitely has some telltale signs of it. All right. So, um, so we did an ultrasound actually, she came with an imaging study from the outside and we just repeated it. Um, there was no venous disease uh, in the leg, um, no reflux, no, no indication of previous deep vein thrombosis. Um, and we did an ultra um, ultrasound of her pelvic veins, uh, which did show she had compression or obstruction of her, of her iliac vein. Uh, so may Turner syndrome. So basically the iliac artery was, is compressing the iliac vein, causing a little bit of an obstruction. Um, not terrible, uh, but on the ultrasound, again, 
there's some limitations. She, she did have um, some compression. Uh, and, and what was the plan, Fiona, at that point? Uh, you mean, oh. Uh, when, when you saw me the first time. Um, so yeah, uh, continuing the stockings. Uh, and you also referred me to uh, do MLD and continue using the pump. Okay. Um, so despite her having uh, compression or obstruction of the iliac vein, we decided at that point, uh, given the clinical picture, um, that I did not feel that obstruction was contributing to her uh, leg swelling and edema. So we decided not to uh, treat it with uh, venous stenting. Mm -hmm. So what kind of compression uh, stockings are you using? What compression level? You know? uh, 40 to 50. All right. And uh, you wear them every day? Yeah. And uh, tell us a little bit about your experience with MLD as well as with the uh, lymphedema pump. Um, so with MLD, uh, so I've been going to my physical therapist and it's been helping a lot. Uh, so the goal is kind of to reduce the swelling. Um, and I, you know, do find that it's actually helping uh, to reduce the swelling. My foot isn't as big. I, I've kind of been trying to measure and keep track of it. Um, and as far as the pump, uh, I try to use it every night. Um, and it definitely helps relieve the pain. Like at the end of the day, I'll feel like heavy and achiness, but when I use the pump, it definitely makes a difference. Like it'll get a, a slightly smaller and it'll help relieve the pain, like I said. Okay. And uh, are you at a point now that you're pretty happy or controlled as far as your symptoms? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. All right. Julie, Susan, any questions before we move along? No, I think that that it's um, really thorough and I'm glad that you got to see a lymphedema therapist and that you have a home program that's working for you and that you finally got the help that you needed. Agreed, yeah. Yeah. All right, Fiona, thank you for, for, helping, out, for helping out tonight and really providing some insight to um, how we evaluate a patient or the type of questions we ask when we try to figure out what's going on uh, yeah. as a cause of the swelling. Yeah, no problem. It's my pleasure. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. So we're going to move along. Um, uh, Julie, I yep. think I want you to share your screen. Yep. So I'm going to share my screen and I am going to talk a little bit about um, lymphedema therapy. And hang on one second. So what I want to just walk through is, as you said earlier, Dr. Gasparis, there's, you know, unfortunately, she didn't get to come to you soon enough, and it, it has progressed a little bit, um, which is kind of a, a sad situation that, you know, they don't, they don't have, and there's not enough doctors out there that know enough about lymphedema to be able to get some intervention early. Um, but so tonight, I, I think we want to walk through just a what does a lymphedema therapist do? What does the clinic do? What is CDT? And um, primarily for the physicians that are attending, because oftentimes they just really don't know what's happening in our clinic. They know the treatment works, but they don't often know exactly what we do. So I'm going to walk through that. So I want to start by explaining what discipline treats um, lymphedema patients, and that is typically an OT or a PT with the advanced training um, and certification in the management of chronic edema. Other healthcare specialists, such as massage therapists and nurses, often can become certified as well, but they're not able to bill for their manual lymph, lymph drainage. Um, so they don't typically, you know, get certified other than for their own purposes in their own um, wound clinics or within the hospital. So Dr. Michael Foldy is the originator of this particular treatment. And you can see the, the Foldy clinic here in the picture. And it originated in Germany approximately 42 years ago. Um, he originated this and established it with his wife, um, Professor Ethel Foldy. And um, patients all over the world today still travel to the Foldy Clinic to have inpatient treatment for lymph lymphedema and lipedema and a number of other conditions. Um, so there are a number of schools you, throughout the United States that have, ha have established a certification school, and you can see those listed here. So knowing that it started over 40 years ago, I'm, I'm curious to know um, what year would you think that the first specialized lymphedema clinic opened in the United States? Was it 1980, 1955, 
And I'd be surprised if you said 1955. <laughs> okay. So quite a mix. Um, interesting that it's all over the board. Um, so with it being over 40 years ago in Germany, it, the first uh, established clinic in the U.S. was actually not until 1993, um, which really tells us why there is a continued need at this time for increased awareness and education in the area of treating lymphedema patients. So CDT, or complete decongestive therapy, is considered the gold standard of treatment. There are two phases, including inpatient, or excuse me, in clinic, um, and, and, or, and then in, in addition to that, self-care or home, man, or home maintenance. So during the intensive clinic phase, patients are typically seen two to four times per week, depending on the severity and the stage of the disease, as well as patient's insurance coverage, accessibility to a local therapist or a local clinic, mobility status, transportation, and really a commitment to therapy, because it is quite a bit of a commitment. And we know that um, only 50% of the patients that actually are referred to our clinics um, attend our, our treatment sessions, which is unfortunate. Um, each session will last anywhere from 45 to uh, 90 minutes, depending on the patient's body habitus, the tissue thickness, the skin integrity, whether they have active open ulcers, um, also their patient tolerance for the position. For example, if we're treating a patient that is morbidly obese with bilateral lower extremity lymphedema, as well as trunk edema, that could take up to 90 minutes within the session. It's also best practice really to consider um, including a standardized lymphedema functional assessment um, to determine the patient's functional impairments and, and their impact on their daily activities. So the first phase in clinic is an intensive episode of care where the therapist will focus on four main components. This is gonna prepare the patient for phase two, which is their home ma management phase. The first component is manual lymph drainage, and this is gonna be really covered in more detail um, with Sue, but it's basically a, a very specific skin technique. And um, it is eliciting a change in interstitial pressure and you're moving fluid, interstitial fluid away from obstructed or congested areas to more healthy adjacent regions where it can be drained normally. Um, the second main component is gradient compression bandaging, which is also going to be discussed uh, later in the program. But this includes applying a multi-layer short stretch bandaging system to soften fibrosis, really reduce fluid volume, and prepare the limb for an appropriate compression garment. Exercise is the third component, and this is really important that the patients understand that in phase one, their exercise program is as important as phase two. And the reason is that we really want to um, utilize that, that bandaging system so that that external pressure can be applied with activity, uh, really activating that muscle pump and stimulating the lymphatics to absorb more lymphatic fluid and really resulting in a better overall outcome and more reduction. So the exercise program will definitely need to be assessed uh, for patient safety and modified accordingly because it is a bit restrictive in the bandages, but there are specific lymph drainage exercises that patients are often instructed to perform. For example, a therapist might ask a patient to um, initially clear their terminus, which Sue is gonna cover in a little bit, followed by diaphragmic breathing, trunk rotation, side bends, and then following that, um, by maybe having internal and external hip rotation, straight leg raises, uh, knee bends, heel pumps, and then finishing their program with maybe a 10 to 15 minute walk or a ride on a stationary bike. So the last component of this phase is education and therapists have a unique opportunity within their treatment sessions to really educate the patients uh, on the, the importance of meticulous skin care to prevent bacterial and fungal growth. So that would reduce risk of infection. And they also educate the patient on the chronicity of the disease and the potential for progression. And it's not intended to really overwhelm the patient or scare the patient, but actually to 
you know, ensure that, you know, you're going to, you're going to build some confidence in them and, and let them know that by the end of phase two, they're going to have all the tools and all the education to be able to manage their condition independently. So, so Jill, uh, yeah. what's the typical time period for this phase one? So anywhere from two to four weeks, it can be up to six weeks, it can be longer, it depends on the patient's insurance and really um, how often, sometimes patients come five times a week, sometimes they come three times a week, it depends on what the, what, you know, their insurance allows really and what the needs are. And usually within that four to six week period, what percentage of patients would you say get significant improvement uh, defined based on your criteria? I would say 90% of patients have improvement, you know, to what degree will depend on how severe it is and, you know, how compliant they are with the program. So somebody like Fiona, that's kind of, although she's had it for three years and it's extended into her thigh, um, given the fact that she doesn't have at least visible skin damage, um, she should, and she does respond to therapy. Yeah, she would be a perfect candidate for, um, you know, a, an intensive episode of care and, and would see really nice results and, and reduction. And, and really, I think that someone like her, it, you know, that's the perfect patient, of course, she's active and young and really going to be able to manage her condition ongoing. And in your, one of the questions from the audience was, how well does insurance cover uh, space? I really think that's so dependent on the state, the patient's insurance plan, um, you know, whether they're on Medicare, but it really is dependent on their particular insurance. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Sue. Um, no, I agree with that. It depends on their insurance in the state. But I mean, for the most part, I really didn't have so much issue if they covered it. It was how many sessions did insurance cover? Yeah. Um, that was kind of the stickler. And then you have to be a little strategic. And if you only get 10, how are you going to use them? Because mm-hmm. you definitely want to have one for a follow-up at the end, um, maybe three, six months later to make sure that things are working for the patient. Correct. And usually, I mean, based on my experience, when I refer patients out, they usually have an annual allowance, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. A certain number of visits they typically have. So the second phase is your home phase. And um, this as we just said, it really occurs when the patient plateaus, they reach their goals or they've maxed out their insurance. And unfortunately, if we don't set up that patient um, at that time with the tools they need, this is really when they fail. And um, if they don't have their their pump, if they don't have their garments and their night garments and you know the bandages, they can refill so quickly. Even Fiona, as she mentioned, you know, within a couple hours, if she doesn't have her stocking on, she's refilling. And so patients really need to know that, but therapists really have to have everything ready at discharge to be able to have success within their home program. And so um, basically they're sent home with their their garments, their pump, and then a follow-up. And unfortunately, we also don't do really great with our follow-ups because um, it's kind of treated episodically rather than like a chronic disease. So they they tend not to get enough follow-ups with their physician and sometimes with their therapist as well, Um, because they should really be monitoring how it's going for that patient. They should have a yearly check-in or at least six months following their, their treatment to see if if things are working, what is working, what isn't. So CLTs also have to have an excellent understanding of how interstitial fluid is transported throughout the body and back to central cir- circulation. So on the left side of the screen, you can see an image of a superficial lymphatic capillary, a valveless single layer of overlapping endothelial cells, and each cell is connected to surrounding interstitial tissue via the hair-like strands you can see here in the middle image. So as pressure builds up in the interstitial space, these fibers become taut, they open that um, that junction of the capillary, allowing fluid to fill, closing it, and then propelling it onto successively larger pre-collectors and collectors um, known as lymphangion that you can see in the right image. This is the, the smallest um, functional unit of the lymph system or the lymphatic valves vessels, and it contracts at rest about six to 10 times per minute, but it can be increased um, by 
manual lymph drainage or by, you know, gradient compression bandaging with exercises, pneumatic compression. And so that's why we can really move large amounts of fluid in the clinic and the patient can at home with um, advanced pneumatic compression because of just increasing that, um, that lymph angion contractility and moving fluid. Uh, Julie, um... I want to just catch a couple of questions here. Where do you search usually, or where do you find lymphedema clinics? How do you? Well, you, you can know how, what I do, but <laughs> yeah, no, I think a, a couple good sources would be the Lana Association. You can look up Lana, L-A-N-A, and and typically they will have a list of therapists that are located throughout the country. And in addition to that, any major hospital typically will have a lymphedema clinic and they would be able to help you too. Yeah. I mean, I, we, in our Stony Brook, we have our own lymphedema clinic and then mm. there's a couple of surrounding hospitals, but I actually utilize a lot the uh, tactile reps because they have so much connections with these lymphedema clinics. And uh, often, even if there's a long wait, they'll be able to help guide the patient uh, where to go as far as getting access to care earlier to some clinics. That you know, work yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Dr. Gasparis, because all of our reps work with hundreds and hundreds of therapists and they really are um, in a sort of a consultative way, helping patients find those therapists when they need them, uh, even in remote areas. So good. does Medicare cover physical therapy services for, to treat lymphedema? Yeah. Again, I think there's just a number of, um, visits that they that they yeah. are allowed but i they definitely do yeah cover lymphedema therapy and if a woman becomes pregnant um uh, anything that changes afterwards regarding the treatment or during pregnancy oh well there are some you know maybe precautions or contraindications in terms of compression and particularly with pneumatic compression. Um, we don't want any pressure over the abdomen area, uh, abdominal region when the, the woman is pregnant, but we always really encourage patients to have that conversation with their provider and, and you know, go forward from there and reach out to their, have the therapist and the, and the physician. I mean, for, for venous disease, we, I mean, we routinely leave them in compression uh, stockings. Yeah, definitely wearing compression stockings, utilizing the pneumatic compression on the legs, but just not typically over the, the abdomen. Mm -hmm. So lymphatic ducts are the largest lymphatic vessels and, and they form from the union of the collecting vessels. So there are nine major trunks that flow into two main ducts shown here. So these two ducts drain lymph into the right and left subclavian veins at the junctures with the internal jugular vein. Uh, the thoracic duct, the largest duct in the body, collects lymph from the entire left side of the body and regions of the right and um, the right side of the body below the thorax. So ultimately draining lymph into the left subclavian vein. It begins at the cisterna chile, which is an enlarged region of lymphatic vessels that form following the union of the intestinal trunk and the right and left lumbar trunks. Now the right thoracic duct um, you know, drains a lot less fluid and it's just the right upper quadrant, including the right side of the face, neck, head, and the right arm. And that um, drains into the, the right subclavian vein. So knowing that, knowing how that moves from superficial vessels to those deeper, larger vessels and, and then back to the circulating system, you can see why MLD or manual lymph drainage really is effective, which is why Sue is going to do a demonstration of that now. Perfect, okay. Um, let's go ahead. I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, so we are going to move into the demonstration of manual lymph drainage, but before we do that, I just want to touch here on the stemmer sign real quick. Um, as many of you are probably aware, you know, the stemmer sign can be used to help with that diagnosis of lymphedema. Um, typically, the stemmer sign, if you're not familiar with it, is when you can't pinch or kind of tint that tissue at the toe, as you can see in the photo here. So it can help with that diagnosis, but oftentimes as therapists, we are having patients refer to us for treatment of maybe venous insufficiency, but they don't have that diagnosis of lymphedema. And I think that's sometimes because um, providers may be looking to the feet to be a dermatist to make that diagnosis of lymphedema. Um, but know that you can have a false negative stemmer sign when in fact the patient does have lymphedema. We're going to look at that here in one of our videos. Let's see here. 
Okay, so here's an example of a negative stimmers. And in this patient, there does not appear to be any edema in the foot, her tendons, her veins are very prominent. And she does have that negative stimmer sign. You're able to lift and kind of tint that tissue. But with this assessment alone, you know, can we really rule out the diagnosis of lymphedema? So we're going to look at that same patient, even though that patient has a negative stemmers and her limbs appear pretty equal, when we assess her unaffected limb at the thigh, we're able to lift and kind of pinch that tissue pretty easily. However, on her affected leg, she does present with fibrosis throughout the leg, even up into the thigh, as you're unable to pinch and lift that tissue there, which does indicate stage two lymphedema. So again, even though there's a negative stemmers at the foot, we really need to be assessing the entire leg for um, lymphedema as well. So let's go ahead and move into this demonstration of what treatment looks like for your patient when they are referred for management of their edema. We're gonna start with manual lymph drainage here with the demonstration video. Um, and certainly this is helpful for providers and having a better understanding of, you know, what kind of treatment is their patient going through, but also to be able to explain it to their patient so they kind of have an idea of what to expect when they start therapy is that certainly can put their mind at ease as well. Now, treatment for MLD sequence always begins at that cervical region or like Julie referred to as that terminus of the lymphatic system. Because if we recall from the anatomy review, this is where the lymphatic fluid ultimately drains into at that venous angle of the subclavian and that internal jugular vein. And by starting proximately, we can kind of begin to decongest and really open up that lymphatic pathway to prepare that fluid to move from the more distal areas in the case of your vascular patients, their legs. And the sequence is really important for your patients to understand as well as they, they certainly are gonna be confused when you begin to massage their neck and they oftentimes they will ask, you know, why are you working on my neck when it's my feet that are swollen? Um, but this is a great opportunity for therapists to be educating the patients as we literally have them in the palm of our hands for, you know, 30 minutes, even up to 90 minutes sometimes. And I think we can all agree that the more the patient understands their diagnosis and those risk factors, um, the more they're gonna buy into treatment and be compliant. So. Once that terminus is cleared, the therapist is then gonna to move to the abdominal region. Now treatment in this area typically includes both deep or diaphragmatic breathing techniques along with manual lymph drainage. And you can see here the therapist is using different hand positions with pressure while that patient is uh, doing that deep breathing. And these various hand positions are used to really stimulate those deeper lymphatic structures that Julie talked about, you know, the cisterna chile, the, the thoracic, the lumbar ducts, the pelvic, the lumbar lymph nodes, and those organ structures with their lymphatic structures as well. Now, the other thing that a therapist is trying to feel for is maybe any abdominal adhesions. You know, think about your patients that, yes, they have vascular issues, but there's also other comorbidities. They might have undergone a C-section or hysterectomy or hernia repair, and they're gonna have some adhesions that literally can kind of serve as a roadblock for that lymphatic movement through this region. But also in your very large or obese patients that Julie had mentioned before too, we can spend a lot of time in just the abdomen here because it really does optimize that lower extremity fluid reduction. So we're only seeing a short clip of MLD here to the abdomen, but know that it can take up a good portion of that session, really just depending on the size of the patient the extent of their edema, or if any of those adhesions are noted. Now, I do want to point out too that maybe you're concerned about your patients getting MLD directly to the legs. Maybe they have a lot of pain or just fragile skin or draining wounds, or they've had a recent vein procedure. Um, it still can be beneficial to make that referral because we can just focus on the abdominal region to kind of draw that fluid up from the legs, almost like a vacuum effect. And know that, you know, when we refer to the flexi touch, there is a trunk garment that really can kind of stimulate the lymphatic system in much the same way that you're seeing the therapist perform uh, MLD here as well. Now, as Julie went through the anatomy, um, know that the lymphatics are divided essentially into kind of these quadrants. And each quadrant, you know, that lymphatic fluid is moving to a specific area of kind of regional lymph nodes. And as therapists, we're using these manual techniques to manipulate that fluid, you know, from one quadrant across what we call kind of a watershed into a different area to move that fluid from that area of congestion into an area that has healthy, intact lymph nodes. So in the case of your patients with vascular issues, a lower extremity lymphedema, we're moving that stagnated fluid from the legs kind of rerouting it to the axillary region here. And that's why it's important to open up that abdominal region to allow for kind of that free pathway or that highway for that fluid to move on the way to the axilla. 
Now, once the cervical, the abdominal, the axillary region have been cleared, we can move to the legs. Now, the leg itself is treated kind of in segments. So we start proximately to, you know, kind of decongest the thigh before we move to lower parts of the legs or more distal aspect. And the segmented approach really ensures that the lymph vessels that are more proximal are kind of properly cleared and prepared to handle that incoming lymphatic fluid from the, the lower leg. So it's not like just, you know, taking the fluid from the feet and pushing up the leg, you kind of have to remove it in segments. You'll find that the therapist may spend a lot of time at the popliteal region or that medial thigh is this really is an area of pooling because there's kind of this bottleneck as that lymph fluid tries to exit the leg at the knee there. And that's why oftentimes in your patients, you might see that, you know, kind of that hanging edema or that tissue around the knee or even those um, lobules into that upper thigh there. Now, as you observe the therapist techniques here, I do want to talk about some of the common characteristics of manual lymph drainage. This is a very purposeful skin stretch with their hands to really provide that desired effect. And depending on the anatomical structure, maybe the size of the limb, the tissue type, the therapist is going to change their hand placement, you know, the type of strokes that are used and that length of time that's spent in an area. But really overall, there's common characteristics to manual lymph drainage. And one is that it's very gentle pressure. And I really should refer to it more of a skin stretch than pressure as treatment shouldn't be deep um, or a muscle massage, even though your patients will want you to go deeper because it feels good. But if you go too deep, you really can compress those delicate vessels and decrease that mobilization. And by creating that skin stretch, you know, it pulls on those anchoring filaments that Julie talked about to kind of open up those endothelial cells of that capillary to draw the fluid in. Now, another characteristic is that it has both a dynamic or kind of a working phase that's used to promote movement of fluid in that desired drainage direction. And you'll see here, it's followed by what we call a relaxation or a resting phase. And that resting phase allows, um, again, that vacuum effect by that passive distension of the tissue, which leads to refilling of the lymph vessels. And then last is a very slow manual technique, about one to three seconds. Um, faster is really not ed, ed, um, indicated or even going to be effective um, because that lymphangion pulsation is about six times per minute when resting. Now, when we talk about the pump or the flexi touch, it can simulate these same characteristics, provide self automated MLD. So, if you see here, um, this is how it works it has those narrow chambers that inflate and deflate about one to three seconds, which simulates that work and release of MLD as well as stimulating those. Uh, anchoring filaments to open up that capillary to pick up that fluid and move it deeper into the system. And for your patients with chronic edema, MLD really needs to be completed daily through, you know, a therapist or using the FlexiTouch for automated self-MLD in the home. And this can be really difficult for your patients to perform self-MLD at home, um, you know, using their hands because they have pain or limited range of motion. Now, in returning to demonstration of MLD to lower extremities, you know, treatment is going to continue down. We stopped at the thigh, but it goes to the calf, the ankle, the foot, the toes. And once we've completed that decongestive phase, then the therapist starts to move that fluid through the drainage phase all the way back up the leg um, and back up to the axilla region. And on their way, they may stop, kind of rework some tissue changes or fibrosis as well. So that is the end of what manual lymph drainage looks like. I'm going to pass it um, off to Julie here again uh, to talk about, you know, when we complete manual lymph drainage, it is really important that we're bandaging these patients because these patients can refill very quickly after a session of manual lymph drainage. So we need to bandage them to um, really lessen that refill in between sessions here. So with that, Julie, I'll let you uh, take it from here. Thank um, you. Thank that was you. really, really kind of comprehensive. Uh, yes, very, very quick. <laughs> yeah, but really, you know, I mean, we send patients all the time as a, as a physician, and uh, I really don't know what happens uh, in the lymphedema clinic. So it's great to know the detail and, and the, 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 the thinking behind the therapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, you know, skill involved and experience as therapists start to learn, you know, what tissue feels like and, you know, being able to feel for those adhesions and fibrosis and how to get that tissue to soften for the patient as well. And like Fiona mentioned, I mean, if she doesn't wear her bandages, you know, she'll fill it right up. And Julie, right. why don't you go into that as far as how to uh, prevent that? Right. So in addition to understanding the 
manual lymph drainage, um, it being skilled at bandaging is really important, not only for optimal outcome, but for patient safety. As they wear the bandages sometimes for several days over weekends, and if even a small wrinkle or in the gauze or areas that are too restricted can cause a tourniquet effect and reduce blood flow. So in the following video, I'm gonna really demonstrate gradient compression bandaging to below knee patient lymphedema, um, and really using a variety of supplies, including short stretch bandages. And I can't stretch, I can't stress enough that we will recommend short stretch over long stretch because it has a high working pressure and a low resting pressure. And so that means that when the patient is up and active, it's working. And when they are at rest, it is not continuing to compress just like long stretch bandages do. Um, so important to know that. So first, the, um, if you take a look here, I've already applied uh, stockinette as well as low pH fragrance free lotion. And then I'm gonna apply um, a toe bandage. And this is a gauze bandage that is available in one, two or three inch widths. And all these supplies can really be ordered online um, just by Googling uh, compression garments or lower extremity compression kits. It may look easy, but it takes a lot of practice and training to make sure the bandage is applied consistently to each toe. It's important to keep the bandages really close to the skin while wrapping and so that it isn't pulled too tight and not in, in and consistent as I mentioned. Um, otherwise, the patient is going to have extreme pain and those bandages will be taken off probably within an hour after they leave your clinic. Um, so next, the band, the next the therapist will apply Artiflex cotton padding. And this is to really protect bony prominences and also protect um, any wicking or it will wick per perspiration from the skin, especially at night. These can become pretty warm, um, but it's also to really distribute the, the um, have an even distribution for subsequent padding and bandages. The idea is to create multiple layers and enough padding so that the bandages don't dig into the patient's skin with activity, and yet they're not too restricted. So the second Artiflex roll um, is really applied with a spiral pattern just from the ankle to the knee, paying attention to the tibia and doing maybe an accordion passion pattern so that you protect that tibia. This can al also be put over um, uh, wound dressings. And the third part that I just put on was the, the padding. So that comes in a variety of um, types. It could be a gray padding or a circular padding like I used here, but it's really creating that structure and um, setting the patient up for the, the bandages to have a very stiff structure and a gradient, um, a cylindrical shape. So what I'm um, applying here is, is a four to six bandage, four to six centimeter bandage um, that is usually smaller and, uh, you know, narrower. You want to use those uh, more distally and then use the larger bandages progressively uh, more proximal to the leg because you want to, again, create that gradient. And this is in a specific pattern um, that is utilized for every patient. And then you add the next bandage, which is the um, either the eight centimeter or the six centimeter. Now, if you have a patient that has thigh high swelling, you're going to use a 10 centimeter bandage all the way up the leg. And you can see that um, you start the overlap from the underlying bandage um, at about 75%, and then you want to lessen that so that you continue to get a gradient from smaller to larger. Um, again, adding more bandages is going to create that, that gradient. And here I'm just basically making sure the patient has functional range of motion, that they have sensation, and that they are um, the, the pressure feels the same throughout. And this is just going to be a really brief demonstration of some of the clinical modifications that therapists make with challenging areas. So certainly around the malleolus, um, the, it, that, that edema is hard to, to get out and to move. So you might want to have a little kidney shaped padding. Sometimes you can cut you know, custom foam so that you can address and provide more structure and texture to fibrotic areas or papillomas or even um, lobules that need that extra compression. 
And then you would just continue to bandage the leg um, the same as you would if you were not using any of these modifications um, with the Artiflex and the padding. And as I mentioned, there is a gray foam that you see that I placed on the leg. Now, many therapists will use that instead of the, the actual foam padding that you can see here. Um, it kind of depends on the school that you went to and what you learned in your school. And then with that modification, I'm going to do a figure eight because I really want to create more more stiffness, more pressure, um, and that will really, uh, you know, enhance that lymphatic stimulation while this patient is up and moving. And you can also see that I, I apply, try to apply a consistent pull or stretch to each side of the limb so that I get a consistent pressure throughout the entire limb while I'm completing my bandage system. And basically that would be the end of it. And you would again, just make sure that the patient has range, functional range, they, they can move their toes and that it feels similar throughout. Now, Julie, as you're wrapping them, I see you're, you're having them flex their ankle at the end. Yes. Do you yes. have them flex during the wrapping? Yes, you do. You would want to, um, you want to be able to wrap that leg in a functional position so that uh, it, it doesn't cause pain. And if it isn't in a functional like dorsiflexion position, then you, the patient will experience some discomfort when they, when they leave and when they're at rest. Um, so the supplies you see here, many of them I used uh, on this particular patient, and they are really your standard supplies that a lymphedema clinic would have. Now, if they were also certified and able to treat wounds, they would have all of their wound supplies, but you can see that there is, you know, custom made chip, mm -hmm. chip pads and chip foam that uh, therapists really put a lot of thought into how to address some of that more challenging um, tissue, basically. So, let me ask you a question for the, the most challenging leg that I find is that hourglass where they have significant fiber advanced disease yep. with like a really skinny leg from the distal calf and then really big above that. Yes. How do you, how do you really compress them or so what you wrap would do, them so that you can get kind of a uniform. Uh, that's where we would use some of that padding. So we might use additional artifacts to build up that area and um, some of even some, you know, prefab swell spots or foam that you try and get that cylindrical shape and you just pad areas underneath the bandage system so that it's an even distribution of pressure. Yeah. It's just, I can see a lot of padding being going. Mm -hmm. It is. It is quite a bit of padding. It's really, it's very overwhelming sometimes for the patient, but I think that um, once they see and learn how to do it themselves, and I, you know, most patients say that the bandages feel good, right? They feel good with the pressure and with compression on. Um, I just want to briefly- Oh, I was just going to add to that. There are a lot of uh, vendors out there that have uh, pretty neat um, bandaging systems to make it a lot easier where that you're using just a bandaging liner instead of using all those layers of foam and trying to piece it on and secure it. They can use like a bandage liner that they just pull on like a sleeve that kind of, like you say, fills in that area for you too. Right, right. And there's also um, uh, reduction ki kits available now that some clinics use where that is, I think it's made by Medi, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but um, that is another bandaging system that's a little bit easier for patients to use. Mm -hmm. So this is a, just quick, some of the... Quick, really, yeah, yeah. Uh, quick question. Oh, this is an interesting one. Uh, do, can we have this video available uh, for the therapists out there to send over to the physicians that refer patients to them? Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. We would be happy to do that. Um, I, I wanted to show, you know, once that bandaging is complete, once that limb has reduced and you have reached a plateau, then you want to get them right away into your compression. So up in the left um, corner, you can see that, uh, you know, they, you can see right here, this is circular knit. And that is very good for mild edema and relatively inexpensive compared to uh, the more custom garments, but definitely um, for milder edema. And that comes from anywhere from eight to 12 millimeters of mercury up to 40 to 60. I, I see that Fiona wears 40 to 60, and that's a lot higher pressure. So 
certainly patients should be working with a garment fitter and with a, a therapist just because you want to make sure that they have the right size and that they can don the garments and doff them safely um, because circular knit can get really uh, uncomfortable and crease in areas where there is excess tissue and swelling. Mm -hmm. the, the middle one here is a custom garment. These are very expensive, but they also contain incredibly well. You don't have that rapid refill and um, you do need a garment fitter to be able to measure your exact and, and this is great for, for those legs that are unusually shaped and don't have a normal shape to them. And then this one on the right, this is an off the shelf custom. Well, it's an off the shelf flat knit. So that flat knit, like I said, contains better. And um, Solaris comes out, came out with a, a garment that you can order off the shelf and still have the flat knit. So that's available for some patients. Now, if patients have any knee swelling or um, swelling above the knee, make sure they're in a, a thigh high um, because they are going to have some knee pain and we don't want to create more edema above the knee. And gloves are a, a must-have when patients are donning their stockings and they should really be instructed how to don stockings with the gloves because it will make their life easier, it will make them more compliant, and um, it will make it just much more comfortable for them to put them on and off. And then it's alternatively, uh, yeah. Um, 40 to 60. Yeah, exactly. And so if, if patients aren't willing or able to, you know, don a stocking, then they would wear one of these off the shelf um, strap binders on the right here. And they're relatively inexpensive and do, do a nice job with containment as well. And I just will add to that, Julie, I mean, you can see here, there are so many different options just from styles and brands to flat knit to circular knit to Velcro. Um, and, and But there is a lot that goes into that decision making because you do have to look at what is their grip strength? What is their range of motion? Can they bend over? Do they have people to help them? What type of containment do they need? You know, so let your therapist help you with determining what's right for the patient because a poor fitting garment or one, um, you know, poor fitting one can cause more harm than good. And certainly if they can't get it on, it's sitting in this drawer isn't going to do any good either. So, you know, let us kind of help you wade through what are some of those garment options as well? And, and that brings up a good point because we want to also be able to work with those patients that maybe are not compliant because they have poor balance, poor, you know, um, poor mobility, and, and we can work with them in modifications and um, helping them in other areas, but other body systems as well. Absolutely. So just the last slide, when do we refer to a therapist for D, um, CDT and flexi touch? The, the obvious one is chronic swelling, of course, but and skin changes, but also those patients that have achy, heavy, heaviness in their legs, like Fiona, if she had been maybe recommended a little bit earlier based on those subclinical signs, um, SEEP score of three or greater, and any uh, pain or, you know, things that I don't know. Can you think of anything else, Sue, that, you know, would be really subclinical that would, you know, strike a physician to get them into a lymphedema clinic? No, I think, too, just those early signs and symptoms of the achiness, heaviness, fullness, and, and the chronic swelling before skin changes happen, ideally. Yeah. And, and I can and see exactly also, what happened with Fiona. She probably had some mild swelling to start with. She right. saw some primary, probably got an ultrasound. There was no DVT and they just poo pooed it, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's unfortunate um, because really you could sometimes prevent that from progressing to those irreversible stages of two and three. And then just finally, you know, not one component is a standalone and, and that includes bandaging, manual lymph drainage, pneumatic compression. They all have to really be used together to have a successful program. So. Okay. Yeah, so um, submit your questions through the Q&A and- We have plenty, despite me trying <laughs> to keep up. All right, let's see. Um, when you're putting these uh, garments or, or bandages on, uh, Julie, do you use a device to measure the actual pressure you're, you're delivering? I know there's a couple of devices that are out there where you can actually put under the bandage and there is something happens. called a pico press uh, that you can. Um, some of the the, the sleeves and the, the night garments actually have um, a, a a pressure gauge that you can use for home use. Uh, typically with bandages, we don't generally use a pico press or any kind of um, system to measure applied pressure. 
And I, I think it becomes, you know, just with experience and, and like Julie was showing you, when you feel the bandages, you know, you can kind of feel how much pressure there is on there along with um, educating the patients that, you know, what they're feeling too there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think that's what we learn in the schools too. We, we do it a number of times to, to really know the exact pressures to apply. Uh, someone's asking, why isn't the ball of the foot covered? But you do cover the foot, the ball of the foot, right? I did cover it with the stockings and the toe bandages. All right. Um, and, and the Artiflex, I think. I think it was just the foam you didn't put on the actual foot. And like I yeah. said, a lot of times it depends oh. on the swelling they have on the top of their foot. You may add foam there if they have like the big buffalo hump. But sometimes we try to decrease some of those lasers so they can get a good sturdy shoe on to keep them right. balanced. I mean, really that foam is just kind of to help give shape and uh, form to that bandage. If it gets too restrictive, then they have a hard time walking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually yeah. we use what's called a Darko boot or some kind of a strap sandal to wear over the bandages so that they can be mobile. If we maybe can uh, share um, with the uh, attendees, uh, some of the, someone is asking for references of companies who make those pre-made foams. Oh, definitely. When we, I, uh, I don't have the brand names here, but I, I, I know Solaris, um, Juzo, Jovi, Medi, they all, um, Jovi, J-O-V-I, and um, they all make the prefad swell, uh, swell pads. Uh, and Lohman and Rauscher also has supplies of uh, the padding and, and the foam. And do you send all your patients uh, to a certified fitter after a therapy? I think it depends on if this is a mild um, patient that is active, like Fiona, if, if she were wearing an 8 to 12 or a 15 to 30 compression that she can, you know, order online, mm -hmm. um, I would instruct her myself. I, I, I don't think she needs a garment fitter for that. But if someone has um, more significant edema and really is going to need some exact measures, mm -hmm. uh, measurements. Um, someone's asking about the Velcro wrap. So I find those to be very useful in patients who, um, you know, either have arthritis or, or obese and can't get down uh, mm -hmm. to bend over to put their stockings on, um, or, and they don't have anybody at home to help them. Uh, but sometimes, you know, when they're, I actually have them in the office bend over and see if, you know, how low they can get. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, some of them will not even be able to get a Velcro wrap on. Uh, yeah, and well, those really yeah. are nice because patients also can wear those to bed mm -hmm. if they need to. Do you have a go-to Velcro system? I really don't. I mean, I know there's a couple of companies that have. You know, I think it, it, it again, depends on the patient. Um, you know, Solaris has the ready wrap. And um, what is the... Which there's juxtalite and, and, juxtalite. and you know, I, and I think there's the benefit sometimes of getting them to a certified fitter because they have a lot of samples there. So the patient yeah. can feel them and touch them and, you know, do the Velcro straps. Some have more straps or less straps. Some have kind of a built-in um, system where it kind of cuffs the leg before you start Velcroing it. So it, it gives a patient an idea to look at them and play with them to see too, and have a little bit of say in what they think is going to work best for them versus you know, we as providers making that decision for them. And honestly, I, as a therapist, I always had samples in my clinic. Mm -hmm. And so the, like you said, they can feel it and touch it. They can um, put it on. And most often they're going to say, I like this one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Re reach out to your, uh, your, your sales reps for those types of uh, manufacturers, because they're happy to leave you samples too, for your patients to see in the clinics. Definitely. Mm -hmm. How long do you keep the bandages on I mean, between changes? I know we talked about uh, when they come for therapy, it could be five days a week or three days a week. Depends right. On yeah. yeah. You know, if you're trying to spread out their treatments, sometimes it can be two, three days. Um, you know, oftentimes if you have someone that can rebandage, shower and rebandage, um, then, you know, that's the benefit of having, you know, to learn yourself that mm -hmm. if you do need to take a shower or, you know, you can't get to therapy that day that you can do it yourself. But I would say two, three, four, sometimes four days. Yeah. I mean, when we do Una boots, we'll leave them on for a week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think you safe, safely for three days. Yeah. Um, 
I've never heard of this one. Have you heard of vibration plates being used for men? Yes, anxiety? yeah. So that's something that um, a lot of patients with lipedema also use quite a bit. And there is, um, I don't know how much clinical evidence there is or data that shows that it does, you know, that shaking or vibration is stimulating the lymphatics. And so oftentimes um, it's for pain relief. And um, sometimes patients will use the vibration plate and then um, do some exercise afterwards. So I, I know quite a few patients that, that utilize those. So, I mean, you said that 90% of the patients will improve uh, with therapy. What's the next step if, let's say, MLD doesn't work or compression? Well, what I've done in the past is, um, you know, if I've had a significant challenges with a patient and, and it wasn't even compliance, it was just really severe uh, fibrosis and edema. What, what I have done in the past is go through an entire episode of men, um, CDT, have them go home for a while, do their home program, and then to come back and do it all again. And sometimes that second time through an episode of intensive care can make further reductions. And I think sometimes it's setting those expectations for patients because, you know, a lot of times patients are looking for that sizable reduction in their limb. But, you know, if they are later stages with severe skin changes and fibrosis by the time they start CDT, you know, they may not have a sizable reduction in the leg, but just educating them about what progress really is or, you know, that it can be improved skin changes, you know, decrease in that redness, um, decrease risk of infections. Maybe they went from, you know, five bouts of cellulitis that year to no cellulitis. I mean, that, that definitely is still success, even though they're not seeing that reduction and, in the limb. And the I other think thing is, is the clinical symptoms. I mean, Fiona, I didn't share with you the, her limb has reduced in size, uh, but not drastically. I mean, when you see her, you can still see that the left leg mm -hmm. uh, has a you know, significant edema. I think she reduced uh, in the ankle like about three, four centimeters. Mm -hmm. uh, um, mm -hmm. But her symptoms, her pain and stuff is much better controlled. That's what I was hearing from her. She sounded like it was better managed. Uh, it wasn't as uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I always try and talk to patients about what functional changes they have. Can they go up the stairs now where they couldn't before? Can they lift their legs into their car? You know, is there a, um, a walk from, you know, around the block or to a friend's house that they weren't able to do? Those are better benchmarkers than um, the reduction. Nice. Yeah. I agree. Plus, plus, like Susan said, I mean, cellulitis episodes, I think, obviously right. significant morbidity and and worsening of lymphedema and cost to the system. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we're just about yeah. seven minutes after the hour. So I'd like to thank uh, Julie and Susan and especially Fiona uh, for participating. And just want to let you all know about the upcoming uh, webinars. You can see them listed here. I'm not going to uh, read them all. Uh, and I'd like to thank Tactile really for kicking off the year, I think, with a blockbuster uh, program. I think a lot of people enjoyed it and a lot of good comments uh, in the chat room um, uh, on the benefit. Actually, I love the one that said, this would be great for medical students for education. Mm. Um, so thank you everybody and have a good night. Thank, thank you. you.